You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your murder mystery world tour. And we are here, Herds, with a new novel. Yes, we are chatting about Death in Hilo by Eric Redman. The latest in a series of two novels of a Hawaiian murder mystery playing Cop Kawika Kwong. The name Kawika is like a Hawaiian transliteration of the name David. Yes, yes, it is. And the novel is self described as Hawaiian noir, which is not a genre that I was previously familiar with, but I'm very excited to kind of get into today. I am, of course, the expert and. Flex is in the hot seat. I hope it's hey. nice and hot uh, under the, the Hawaiian sun over there. <laughs> <laughs> this novel is really exciting and interesting in a bunch of ways that it resembles sort of a police procedural. We've got a serial killer stalking the streets of one of Hawaii's biggest cities and dropping bodies in a park that only the locals visit. That is kind of how we open the story, we have Kavika and we have Ivona Ivanovna. We've got all these crazy names dropping around here. They're investigating this park slasher, but they find a body that doesn't quite fit the MO. And there's stuff going missing from the police station. It's this whole thing. We'll get a little bit more into that in the mystery section. But one of the things that I've really enjoyed about this novel so far is that it's very in touch with trying to be a Hawaiian story. There's a lot of time and penance paid to the local culture in a way that feels very reminiscent of the the Hawaii I've experienced being there, which may mean that it's a very touristy novel because I've only been there as a tourist. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair enough. No, I mean, I like that the novel opens with a discussion about pronunciation, which I'm going to try to follow. It talks about how, you know, if there's a Hawaiian word, they end in vowels and you put the emphasis on the second last syllable, which I've tried to follow there, as you can tell, that's something that opens with, you know, paying some respect to, you know, this is how you should speak the language. And there is discussion of the different languages that Hawaiians speak, which is quite fun. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's really nice about this book that's like immediately apparent is its characters and the fact that they are morally gray in a bunch of ways that I think go harder than a lot of other stories kind of do moral grayness in the murder mystery world that we come from. This story, despite sort of branding itself as noir, also brands itself as a bit of a murder mystery. And I don't think that we get so much in the murder mystery world of like cops who have just done ethical crimes, (laughs) like straight up covered up killers and evidence and stuff because they believed it was the right thing to do. It's a theme that we often pay a lot of praise to books when they do it in our space. So it's kind of fun seeing this sort of different side of the fence where it's just like a matter of fact. It's the premise of the novel rather than the thesis. And there is an awful lot of time spent on that as the driving drama of our main characters because we are following on from the previous novel in the series. I believe it's Bones and Hilo. I believe yes, it is. Bones and Hilo. There is a case that is you know brought up as part of the prologue of this novel, the Fortunato case which was solved in the previous book, you know, because it's set 12 years later, but the decisions that Kavika made in the previous case, in the previous novel, are coming back to haunt him. And true to murder mystery form, we're kind of being episodic and that you can jump into this novel without having read the previous ones, but there is an interesting dance where it's such a central part of Kavika's <laughs> yeah. personal drama in this book, but we're also trying very hard not to say the name of the killer from the previous book, which creates some difficulties, let's say, for Redmond to ride around. Yeah, there's a lot of exploration of which characters know what about the past cases, but we can never explicitly say what they know because we're trying not to spoil the past book. And there's this weird ghostly figure in the form of the actual killer of the previous book who is sort of never even really addressed by everyone. Well, apparently they're dead. Yes, apparently they're dead. According to this book. But again, we don't actually reveal who that character is. Personally, feel like we should really just spoil the previous book and get on with it and treat this as a true (laughs) continuation. Because this is something that's going to keep cropping up throughout the novel, that we keep dancing around the solution of the previous novel while also re-explaining the plot of it in a way that is not quite clear enough for my liking. Yeah, it's like it's a book that you almost wouldn't want to sit down and read 
all in one week because you'd be recovering a lot of ground. But if you're like pacing it out over a few days or a few weeks, it really like keeps you up to date with what's going on. And it's an interesting way to do it. I will say this sort of re-explaining that occurs, it kind of keeps you up to date with what's going on. I do appreciate to a degree because I often complain about there being too many characters in a murder mystery or (laughs) too many superfluous characters that I'm like, who are you again? Why do I care? But there are a few points in the novel where there's kind of subtext that I think most mystery novels that I've read, you kind of have to figure out the subtext for yourself. But Eric wants to make sure that you are with him every step of the way. Yeah, I think that this book's approach to letting subtext speak for itself does kind of rub me the wrong way a little bit. But like at the same time, I feel like the book, as you sort of suggest, does it to try and be inclusive in a way that I can sort of get behind. Yeah, it's it's a tricky one. Like, as I say, it is not the approach that I would take as obviously an, an acclaimed murder mystery writer myself. Yeah, I would. I would not. I would not take this approach, but I do appreciate that we're we're keeping everybody along for the ride, which is excellent. I think the thing I would like to see as the book goes on is the reins like come off a little bit and start to see the subtext be allowed to speak for itself. So we'll see how that goes. We'll see. We'll see. All that said, though, I think that the characters that are built through that very um, descriptive writing are like. All really fun characters. Terry, who is Kavika's former mentor figure from the previous novel, and the way that it explores like their relationship having broken down over the ethics crimes that Kavika committed <laughs> at the end of the last book, and how they've had to like rebuild that over the 10 years since that book happened. I thought was really fun. This idea that you would see the things that they're saying as being very friendly and they would seem to have a good relationship, but because of the description that is being given to us by Eric, you sort of know that they're performing a little bit. And I do like the way that that's used to say more about the relationship in the same way that sometimes a performance is convincing in real life, but you sort of know. I really like Zoe, our reporter character, right? She is causing problems for our hero and everyone that he knows and loves. She's kind of the villain, Um, whether or not she's the murderer, you know. She's the B villain to our protagonists, Mm. but she's also sort of doing the right thing. Doing it for the wrong reasons, though, based on her discussion with her senior journalist. Scully, he's like the, the top reporter in Honolulu. And he's mentoring this new young gun. But also the work she's doing as a reporter to uncover a 12 year cover up is extremely important, you know, uncovering corruption in the police force. Well, and this is also one of the things that I think does actually shine about the way that Eric writes is that that theme of her doing the right things for the wrong reason in juxtaposition to them doing the wrong things for the right reasons is like a very direct moral battle that the novel is playing with. There are definitely characters that you expect to be, you know, just horrendous who are kind of doing the right thing. And and even characters who seem untouchably morally good that maybe are not as spotless as they appear, you know? I think a lot of the things that we're describing here are like some of the staples of the sort of noir subgenres of the world. And it's really fun seeing them put into this context in Hawaii where I feel like we don't often get a lot of serious crime. And that's something that the book sort of explores through Ellie, who is Kavika's wife. And she's a murder mystery novelist who like wrote (laughs) a story based on the previous book in this real series by Eric. And I think that Ellie's sort of transformation between the two books to where she's now writing grim noir that looks at the actual problems going on in the society of Hawaii is is sort of a, a fun thing to look at because of the way that we often get this very goofy, tourist-oriented perspective on the islands. I'm excited to see how you solve an entire murder mystery when there's barely even been a murder on screen. There's a lot of groundwork that a murder mystery book would have laid by now that we don't have. And it entices me in a, in a fun and interesting way. I don't even know if we have suspects, but we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, 
You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are talking Eric Redmond's death in Hilo, and we will be back with more of that in just a second. Stick around. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour to SER 107.3. Listening to Death the Reader, Flex here with you. I am delighted to be joined by one of the few authors that actually still pulls my physical bookshelf home. That is Garth Nix. He's a fantasy and children's author, which you might know for the Keys to the Kingdom series, Sabriel, Sir Harrowood and Mr. Fitzel, most recently the left-handed bookseller of London. Garth, it is a delight to welcome you to a not fantasy-related program here on Death of the Reader. <laughs> welcome. It's good to be with you. I guess the thing I wanted to get into today is that. One of the things that I remember most fondly from your work growing up and from diving back into it just ahead of this interview is sort of the way that you use authority figures in your work, be it Sir Harrowood and Mr. Fitz carrying out the duties of a council or the police forces and analogues therein in the Keys to the Kingdom. What is it that attracts you to that sort of police and authority mindset that pervades your work? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I've not been asked that one before. I think I like subverting the expectations around those things. Nothing is ever really what it seems, I guess. I mean, and Sir Herod and Mr. Fitz, you know, they're agents for the Council for the Treaty for the Safety of the World, but it's long defunct. They're kind of like the executive arm of an organisation that no longer exists, but they're still carrying out their duty. And I guess that kind of appeals to me. Institutions or people working for institutions that take what they want from it and carry on with it, even when the institution itself has disappeared. I write the kind of books that I want to read myself. So I am a huge mystery and thriller reader. And you know, with this, the left-handed booksellers of London and the sinister booksellers of Bath, I mean, those books in particular, I wanted to write fantasy thrillers that have elements of police procedurals. But I like when I'm writing them to add in elements of the fantastic. Yeah, I think it's so interesting too, because especially in the left-handed booksellers of London series, one of the things, as you say, that stands out, it is very police procedural when, I guess, from our world over here in crime fiction, it's so often the case that we don't really get to explore those fantastical concepts because it breaks the fairness of the game. But that's something that you get to have so much fun with by sort of reinventing the rules, as you were saying there. Is that kind of the key draw of melding those two worlds together to you? In those books, one of the things I do like, and this is something that I've enjoyed in other people's books, is the police as a whole do not know about the booksellers, but some members of special branch have to for, for their job. So I guess that appeals to me as well. In you know, organisations within organisations where only some people know what's actually going on. And I guess that's kind of a feature of espionage novels and, and how you know spy organisations work. I mean, invariably, only some of the people really know what's going on and quite often will go to great lengths to make sure that it stays that way. With the bookseller books in particular, it's not just about ordinary secrets. It's about mythic and fantastical secrets as well and, and the necessity of preserving that secrecy. So I guess I'm I'm kind of melding the genres that interest me. But of course, you've got to be careful. You can get it wrong, obviously. I hope that I haven't because you can alienate the people who like fantasy or you could alienate the people who like mysteries. Hopefully in those books, it ends up appealing to both. But certainly I've read books where I've not liked how, how the genres have been combined. Yeah, I mean, I still often think for as fantastic as the novel is, there's this moment in Caves of Steel where Isaac Asimov has the case unraveled by a Polaroid photograph 3,000 years into the future, and it's like, Isaac, you were, you were so close. <laughs> <laughs> I guess one of the other concepts that you sort of bring up there is this idea of the inscrutable or the incomprehensible. What is it that attracts you to writing around those themes? The appeal of of the numinous and the, and the mystical is something that's, sort of ingrained in, in humans, and that's where religion comes from. I'm not personally religious, but I'm deeply interested in religion and mysticism and that sense of the numinous, of something greater being out there beyond us. And I think when you can properly capture that in a story, I think it's quite hard to do, that's a very powerful thing. I mean, stories in themselves are often a way of conveying that sense of numinous and the mystical, you know, whether it's in actual religious writings or it's in 
very powerful emotional stuff. And if you can get that right, I think that that really makes a, a story stick in people's heads. I think it's interesting that you approach that from the angle of religion, because I guess the perspective that I was coming from is also the fact that to some extent people are incomprehensible and inscrutable. The example I brought <laughs> well, up- Well, there's that, that, that as well, yeah. of course. Because the, the example I brought up with Samantha Shannon, who you spoke with at the Sydney Writers Festival recently, was the fact that the killer's motives in crime fiction are something that we can sort of understand, but never quite- understand on a level that would get us to take the same actions and that's sort of one of the big hang-ups of the genre and i think it's interesting looking at the way that fantasy through that sort of inscrutability creates this game of motives where for example in the sahara and mr fitz stories you have all of these godlets who have these unknowable motives and we sort of have to try and understand them to figure out how they're going to be bested in the end. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing with Sarah and, and Mr. Fitz, and one of the sort of interesting aspects of that is Sir Heroid's heart isn't entirely in the job, even though Heroid is part of this extended family of witches who also kill godlets and that's that's their purpose in life. And also, I guess we come back to that sort of organisations continuing to do what what they do, regardless of how things have changed, because they have lists of godlets that are inimicable. Those lists are probably never actually updated. So if the godlet's changed or has changed its nature and is no longer inimical, it's still going to be on the list. But yeah, I guess, I mean, it's interesting talking about the unknowability of murderers, in particular in, in crime fiction. I think in some very good crime novels, you actually can understand and perhaps even empathise with the murder in certain circumstances. I think that's always interesting when you do think, yeah, well, maybe in those circumstances, maybe I would also take that step extreme as it is. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that is sort of the perfection of the parallel, uh, not to toot my own horn too much, but also because like, I think in good fantasy fiction about unknowable things to some extent there's this moment where the concept clicks and i think that that's also the really excellent way that a device can latch itself on and have you thinking about it as you go forwards long after finishing the story the main thing there is that the people need to feel like real people i mean even if the people are literally monsters they do have to feel like they have character they have which is in keeping with whatever world they inhabit so everything has to feel real within the context of the story that you're writing. And, and I think, you know, any story, whether it's fantasy or crime or, or even contemporary realism, you're still trying to make it feel like this is really happening somewhere. Of course, with fantasy, there are elements of the fantastical that do not occur. But if it's done properly, then that's all accepted at the beginning. And as long as you don't spoil it or break it, by you know, introducing the wrong elements or the mixture's not right, then the reader will inhabit that world and, and that story. That's what makes a great book, where you live in it until it's done and then you still think about it and hopefully you want to go back again. Well, and I guess the last thing I wanted to ask before before we leave is, you know, you mentioned an interest in crime and thrillers and, you know, we were talking about the uh, the booksellers series is there a murder mystery coming up in the franchise? Can we get that on our murder mystery <laughs> shelves? Well, The Sinister Booksellers of Bath has a serial killer in it, but it's not strictly a murder mystery. I mean, there are some murder mystery elements. Oh, yeah, you got, you got me hooked, but I need more, Garth. I need more. Yeah, <laughs> it is entirely possible. I do love you know, good detective stories. In general, I'm more interested in the characters and their relationships than I am in the actual mystery. So it's not unknown for me to read something and to forget the details of the murder. Oh, yes, of course. But of course, if you took the murder away, it would be less appealing. Yeah, and as as with, you know, learning something about the world or coming to understand the murderer, you sort of learn the characters through the way they interact with the puzzle. Yeah, you want the whole thing. Exactly. I guess what I like is everything to be everything to be good. There we go. Garth, thank you so much for joining us on Death of the Reader. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Oh, uh, thank you very much. We will have links up on the podcast if you want to find the Sinister Booksellers of Bath, its series, or Sahara Wood and Mr. Fitz, the most recent publications from Garth. Stick around. Want to come on your Murder Mystery World Tour? You're listening to Death of the Reader.
You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your murder mystery world tour. We are talking Eric Redmond's Death in Hilo Part 1. This is a little bit of new release Hawaiian noir. And Herds? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Flex. I just want to say it was very cruel of you to get revenge (laughs) on me for what crimes I committed in Too Much of Water. I like that you think that this is the end of my revenge, but yes, go on. (laughs) By not, I think, giving me the titular death in Hilo. I mean, there has been at least a death, a suspicious death. I will tell you that the main thing we're missing is a named body. Let's put it that way. Because currently we have this setup of this slasher character, whoever that could be, running around killing people in a park. And the fifth victim is... Fifth or sixth, because they're set to break the record for Hawaii's most body-counted serial killer. That's something that the novel has highlighted. But this new body has its head and its hands removed from the corpse, nowhere to be seen, whereas all the previous bodies have been very much intact and identifiable. And if penis piercings as well weren't enough to highlight the strangeness of this murder... Kavika Wong also finds a little letter on his desk, like the day after, that says, hey, I didn't even kill him. And who knows how that letter could have gotten there. I can't imagine you have any sort of idea of who could have put that letter there, considering that nobody has been inside the station except the cops. So clearly the killer has broken into the building somehow. I'll be interested to see how you're going to crack that one. We're currently looking at this situation where it seems like there's at least two killers. There's Slash, a character who's trying to, break a record maybe the novel hasn't really dwelt on the identities of the killers involved in the slasher case so you know maybe we'll we'll see if those characters matter as we go along and then there's supposedly this additional killer who is cashing in on the action so i'll be wanting to know do you think that there are multiple killers in this book there are definitely multiple killers in this book Okay. I think the most obvious one is the slasher. I don't think there is even the foggiest doubt in my mind as to who that is. All right, let's throw down some evidence. Who's the slasher? So there are two Jerry's. (laughs) Yes. There's Jerry Sakamoto, otherwise known as Q Sakamoto, named after the, the Japanese singer. He's been recently partnered up with Jerry Rhodes, who is a fresh import from Los Angeles where he was taken off the force because he murdered a suspect in a chase and the LAPD wasn't happy with him for that. And Kavika, as someone who has done ethics crimes in the past, took one look at that and said, yep, I can endorse someone who does ethics crimes and just put them all on the him. same the same team together to make <laughs> it nice and juicy for his, for his his department now that he's taken over in Honolulu. Body bags are going missing from the Honolulu Police Department. Letters are showing up with no address on them on the chief's desk addressed from the serial killer. I wonder who it could be. It could be anybody in this story. So <laughs> Just for the record, who's the, who's our slasher? It's it's Jerry. It's Jerry Rhodes. Okay. Absolutely, no doubt in my mind. But what if it's a series of clever tricks and red herrings? Maybe it's Yvonne Ivanovna. She's a new character on the scene. Maybe. She is a new character, except that she is sort of our like moral guidepost woman in the story. Which is also interesting. I did want to mention there's this great scene where Yvonne is brought into the office of the current CO, these two women in the police force have this conversation where they're talking about how like, oh yes, you know, we have to make sure that we stand strong and don't let these men get one over you. Yeah, dude, screw sexism. It sucks. Screw sexism. Yeah. But also, here's the ways that you can cut your hair to make it easier to do that. And I thought that the subtext of that scene was either kind of gross or weirdly genius. Look, she's got to do a Milan. That's the that's the lesson here. We got we to cut our <laughs> hair and grab a sword and go to war. Otherwise, men won't take you seriously, and you won't be able to convince them to wear a dress later. No, but I think Yvonne is too much of a, a like moral guidepost character. She's had too many great scenes to like be the betrayal. She is She's too funny. Our up and coming young Watson sort of character in the story. I would never suspect 
the funniest character in the book of being the killer. That's just never happened before. <laughs> All right, fair enough. But the big question is, of course, heard that we have this thing in the foreword, and I do think this is like metatextually loaded, but we had this conversation in the foreword about the 30 meter telescope, and there is no reference to that so far at all in the book. Yes, it is a little bizarre. Truthfully, I really enjoyed getting to stop your like first week of of figuring out what's going on in the book because I find it deeply funny that there's this big foreword about the importance of the of the TNT project and it just doesn't appear at all in part 1. You know, it is essentially the setup for the entire book, and we don't get to the actual thrust of the the political nature of the novel. I can promise you that we will get to matters, political matters of the TMT eventually. But I am of the opinion that you could probably solve the entire mystery just based on these <laughs> opening chapters. The entire mystery. I think so. you give it a pretty good go. I'm not going to say whether or not any killer characters have shown up or not, but I reckon you could make some predictions. I'd love for you to give me your best shot at understanding, you know, where this novel is going and what are you vibing based on this section of the novel? Also, I need you to explain the penis piercing, putting a point on that. Ugh. <laughs> Maybe that's too cruel. I would like for you to attempt to explain the penis piercing this week, if you can. I... I, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to say it never comes up again. No, you can't say that. I reckon it's a complete and utter red herring. I reckon that it will in no way lead us to the scene of the crime. Okay. Well, that's a valid answer. All right. Well, what else is going on in this story? Tell me. Tell me your predictions, Flex. You need to predict the future today with the I power of astrology, which is what this book is about. I think that the key issue yes. that I have available to me is I have the foreword and it introduces the 30 meter telescope. So we know that there's going to be some science involved. Okay. I like science. I think the next character we have introduced in the story is going to be a missing person. And that has to be the victim who we don't have their head. I feel like that's the natural okay. next beat in the plot. <laughs> You're telling me that if we flip over to page one of part two, it's going to say, here is a character that we're introducing, and that's going to be the the dead person. Listen, if I have watched police procedural television that this book feels like, I think we are up to the part in the story where we start going through beat by beat and have, oh, here's the guy that went missing. Are they the body? Of course they're the body. We're going to go and we're going to meet with the scientists. And the first female scientist we meet is going to be the killer. You want to know why I think that? Because the serial killer is a man. And this book is going out of its way to express gender balance. Are you telling me that gender equality is a theme of this novel? I am telling you that. And here is my other big prediction. Ellie, Kavika's wife, who is pregnant with child... Is going to die. Is that also gender equality? Because we had a man's death and now we're going to have a woman's death? That is also gender equality. And she's going to die. She's going to die <laughs> by the hands of the scientist who is a woman because it would be too gross to have a man kill a baby. <laughs> a baby. I guess if you think that some kind of non-crazy woman scientist is going to show up and just be the killer and be so obvious to you because you're a genius. What are we going to spend our time doing, I guess? What sort of puzzle do you think that we're going to have to work out as part of the mystery surrounding the TNT, Mr. I See the Future? I feel like the obvious play is that we have to figure out their connection to the Fortunato case. I figured that it is going to be probably connected to the character that Zoe dug up. Was it Parks? DK Parks? That sounds right. That sounds like a character. Famous for the Parks radio telescope in <laughs> New South Wales. Yeah, that Parks. Mm -hmm. Dude, radio telescope? Radio oh, telescope. DK Parks, Parks oh, radio no! telescope. It's a He's found oh! another connection. I could yes! not have seen this. So we are going to be covering- Parks from is a scientist that works on the telescope and he died in the previous the case. It's going to be connected. Of, I want it to is. say That's part what it three, is. chapter Lock 27. Lock it in. Definitely, definitely what are we covering next week on the show, Herd? This is going to be great. We'll get strapped in.
This is Death of the Reader. You're listening to 2SCR 107.3. We will be back with more of Eric Redmond's Death in Hilo on your Murder Mystery World Tour. Catch you then. We're out of here.